All right, let's open up our Bibles to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. We'll be looking at verses 5 through 11. Uh, last Sunday night we looked at 5, 6, and 7, and we're going to kind of cover it as a whole this morning. So when you get there, please stand. We'll honor the reading of God's Word. Hebrews 12, verses 5 through 11. <clears throat> And ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children, My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? But if ye be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? For they verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure, but he for our profit, that we might be partakers of his holiness. Now no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless... Afterward it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you and praise you again for this blessed day or this opportunity we have. And, and I just I thank you so much already for the, the, the singing, the prayers, the praises, Lord, the, the children's message, Lord. I just pray that all that continues were to be beneficial to us. Lord, that our hearts, our minds, our ears are open to the teaching of your word. And Lord, that we don't uh, just let it fall by the wayside. That Lord, that we are doers and not hearers only. And Lord, we thank you again most of all for your son Jesus Christ. Lord, it's through him we have our strength. It's through him we have all our blessings. And Lord, we thank you and praise you for that great sacrifice that he made for our sins on the cross. Lord, it's in his name we pray. Amen. So last Sunday night, again, as I said, we began discussing the chastening of the Lord. And of course, the word chasten, as we typically use it, means uh, correction as far as correcting for sin or a punishment for sin. When we think about us chastening our children, it is punishing them for something that they did wrong. And it absolutely means that in this situation because we see the same word used in Revelation 3.19 where it says, As many as I love, this is Jesus speaking, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous therefore and repent. And so God does chasten his children. When we sin, he rebukes us and he chastens us. And I thank God for that. Because if we didn't, well then we'd go on and we'd keep sinning. We'd think there'd be nothing wrong with it. But in a general sense, looking at this word chastening, it means instruction. And that's what we talked about last Sunday night. And it's made clear in this passage that we are being instructed. Because we are his. We are children of the Father. He is our Father, and our Father instructs us in many different ways. And you equate that to how a father uh, instructs their child in our regular life. And sometimes it's just by simply telling, simply teaching. We have the Word of God to instruct us and teach us in that way. And then sometimes it's by punishing wrongdoing, showing and teaching how to do things, or by simply being there when they're doing it. You know, I, you can teach your children sometimes, hey, won't you do this, and I'll be there to watch you and help you. And so everything that God requires us to do, if we're his children, he's there with us. Okay, as, as David wrote about in the Psalms, when he makes his bed in hell, who's with him? God is with him. And so as we're instructed, as we go through this life, God instructs us by being with us oftentimes. But looking at the instruction and teaching of the Lord, some verses that we covered last Sunday night, I'm going to repeat them just quickly here this morning. 
Psalm 94, 12 and 13 says, Blessed is the man whom thou chasteneth, O Lord, and teachest him out of thy law, that thou mayest give him rest from the days of adversity until the pit be digged for the wheat for the wicked. And so it's talking about chastening and teaching at the same time. And then in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, where it says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction. That's the same word as chastening in Hebrews 12. For instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. But remembering the context of these verses of Scripture, we go back to chapter 10 where it says, We need patience. We need endurance in verse 36. For you have need of patience, that after you have done the will of God, you might receive the promise. And we need that endurance because we're called to run this race, as it talks about in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. And this race where the Greek word is agon, and it means agony, and it means an agonizing race. We're given the examples in chapter 11. And we get a glimpse of what all these things these people had to endure. Because looking at the context of the whole situation, we look at chapter 11 and the things that these people endured and had to go through as they walked by faith, it was teaching them. It was instructing them. It was chastising them to use the word here in Hebrews 12 in the King James. And we see that in verses 33 through 37 where it talks about some of the things they had to go through who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, waxed valiant in fight, turned to flight the armies of the aliens, women received their dead, raised to life again, and others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. And others had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings, Yea, moreover, of bonds and imprisonment, they were stoned, they were sawn asunder, they were tempted, were slain with the sword, they wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, and tormented. And those were a lot of things that they had to endure. And, and remember when, I, when we went over these verses, I kind of divided it into two. We see the first couple of verses, we see like a conquering, a, somebody proclaim, or obtaining a victory, and then after that, it was them kind of receiving punishment or being under persecution. But here's the thing, through all of it, there was a fight. There were trials. To subdue kingdoms, you have to fight against those kingdoms. It talks about stopping the mouths of lions. That takes some, takes some gall. If we come face to face with a lion, a lot of us, we're just going to be scared and just and wilt. But it took a fight to subdue those lions. Now, uh, and it may not be a physical fight. David, he had a physical fight with a lion. Daniel did not. But he believed God had come and stopped those mouths. But we have been promised that we will have hard times in Scripture. You know, in 2 Timothy, I've quoted this verse, but it says we will suffer persecution if we live godly in Christ Jesus. We're promised that. Okay, if we live godly, we will suffer persecution and we'll suffer problems simply because we live in a fallen world that is cursed by sin. That's it. I mean, we have issues, we have trials here on this earth that may not result from our faith and being persecuted for our faith, but the fact that we live in a fallen world, that sin entered the world with the fall of Adam and Eve. But verse 8 tells us the time that we are to worry is when there is no chastisement, when there is no instruction in that way. It says, but if ye be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are you bastards and not sons. If we don't have those difficulties, it may be indicative that we're not the sons or the daughters of God, that we're not his children. The ancient Christian writer Jerome said, the greatest anger of all is when God is not angry with you. And that kind of gets into Romans chapter 1 that we've been studying where he turned them over to their fleshly desires. He quit correcting them and let them have their sins. But oftentimes when we go through these things again, whether it's persecution for our faith or whether it's just the problems that we have here on this life, we ask, why is this happening to me? 
Why am I going through this? And have you ever asked yourself that? You know, why am I having these health problems? Why did I lose my loved one? Why am I having these financial problems? Why? I, I, I go to church. I follow God. I pray. Why are these things happening to me? And we do it as like we're the only ones that's ever went through it. Every sickness that you can go through, somebody else has gone through it. It's not just you. Any breakdown in, in relationships, any financial troubles, there's other people that have went through it. But yet we still, we ask, why is this happening to us? And then it makes it worse when we look at those that may be actively rebelling against God and that enmity with God, and we're like, well, they have it made. God's blessing them, and here I am suffering. Jeremiah chapter 12 Verse 1, he says, Righteous art thou, art thou, O Lord, when I plead with thee, yet let me talk with thee of thy judgments. Wherefore doth the way of the wicked prosper? Wherefore are all they happy that deal very treacherously? And, and to sum up that, that verse, he says, Lord, when I plead with you, let me talk to you about how you're judging people. So he says, why does the way of the wicked prosper? Why are they prospering? Why are they happy, all the ones that deal treacherously? Why do they have it made? Why are they living this good life? And it happens more than it should when we envy those type of people. They may be out of fellowship with God. We may know they're lost, but they may have money. They may have material blessings, and we envy them. And if you think about that, it would be like Lazarus envying the rich man. Okay? And, and on this earth, we think that would make sense. Here he is, poor, covered with sores, sitting at his gate, and the rich man is not wanting for anything. And we would think that Lazarus would say, oh, if I could be like him. But when we look at the end of that story, did Lazarus have any reason to be envious of the rich man? No. Abraham tells the rich man, said, look, you got your good while you was on this earth. As fleeting as it is, because you can experience none of it now. But we envy those people a lot of times. We question why we're going through the hard times, and we envy those who seem to have it easy. In Psalm 73, I'm going to briefly cover basically the whole psalm. But in verses 1 through 7, this is a psalm of Asaph. He says, Truly God is good to Israel, even to such as are of clean heart. But as for me, my feet were almost gone. My steps had well nigh slipped. He's saying I almost slipped up. And the reason being in verse 3, it says, For I was envious at the foolish when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. For there are no bands in their death. Their strength is firm. They are not in trouble as other men. Neither are they plagued like other men. Therefore pride compasses them about as a chain. Violence covereth them as a garment. Their eyes stand out with fatness and they have more than heart could wish. And so he says he was envious for all these things. They had it made. Then we go on to verse 13 to compare that to what Asaph was going to. He says, Verily I have cleansed my heart in vain. I have washed my hands in innocency. For all the day long have I been plagued and chastened every morning. He says, These guys have it made, and here I am being chastened every morning. But in verse, six, verse 16 he says, When I thought to know this, it was too painful for me until I went into the sanctuary of God then understood I therein. Surely thou didst set them in slippery places. Thou castest them down into destruction. How are they brought into desolation as in a moment they are utterly consumed with terrors. And so he says, when I went to the sanctuary of God, I learned better. I learned more. And seen or I saw their end that it was desolation and that it was terror. And once he realizes that, we go to verse 22. He says, So foolish was I and ignorant. I was as a beast before thee. Nevertheless, I am continually with thee. Thou hast holden me by my right hand. Thou shalt guide me with thy counsel and afterward receive me to glory. 
Whom have I in heaven but thee? There is none upon earth that I desire beside thee. And so once he understood, he says, yes, they have it made here on this earthly life, but they will slip. But I still have God. No matter what I go through, I still have God. And so we are to never envy the wicked or those at enmity and out of fellowship with God. And then another tempting thing to do and while we're asking, hey, why is this happening to me, is having some sort of a pity party. Everything is just so bad. And, you, and we have those people in our lives, if, if we ask them how it's going, if it ain't going that great, they're going to tell you about it. And it almost seems like a pity party. But here's the thing, when we look in Scripture, that's never looked at as a good thing. When people say, woe is me, or everything is just so bad. I remember when I was a kid, I kind of had this. And I'm so glad I'm, I've grown up. But when I was a kid, I thought I had it worse out of anybody in this whole world. And, and, and I thought this to myself, and I remember specifically thinking this. I'd be like, I can't see well. I have to have glasses. I got tubes in my ears, and that affects me. I can't go swimming without putting earplugs in. Uh, I was a little chubby at times. I thought I was ugly. I was slow when it comes to sports. I was like, I've got it terrible. Thank God I grew up. But we do that sometimes. We think about those things. Oh, this is happening to me. I have this ailment. I have this sickness. These things are going on in my life. And I'm, I'm reminded of Joshua. In Joshua chapter 7, they get defeated by the people of Ai. And Joshua has a pity party. Joshua chapter 7, verses 6 through 10 says, Joshua rent his clothes and fell to the earth upon his face before the ark of the Lord until the eventide, he and his elders of Israel, and put dust upon their heads. And Joshua said, Alas, O Lord God, wherefore hast thou at all brought this people over Jordan to deliver us into the hand of the Amorites, to destroy us? Would to God that we had been content and dwelt on the other side of Jordan. O Lord, what shall I say when Israel turneth their backs before their enemies? For the Canaanites and all the inhabitants of the land shall hear of it and shall environ us around and cut off our name from the earth. And what wilt thou do thy great name? He said, Lord, you've brought us out of Egypt and, and, we're, and we're defeated and we would have been content if we'd have stayed on the other side of the Jordan. Why did you do this, God? How did God respond? He said, get up. The Lord said unto Joshua, get thee up, wherefore liest thou upon thy face? He said, get up. And there was a lesson to be learned there. The reason they were defeated by Ai is because there was sin in the camp. And we read about how Achan blatantly disobeyed the commandments of God. He kept the Babylonian garment and the pieces of silver. But it brought sin into the camp. But again, there was a lesson. There was punishment for sin there. And there was a lesson, hey, God said to obey him. We see something similar in 1 Kings 19. And I'm not going to turn there, but we know that's when Elijah was running from Jezebel. You know, he had defeated the prophets of Baal at Mount Carmel, and, and he leaves because Jezebel had said, look, if you're not like these other prophets by the end of the day, because all the prophets of Baal had been slain, she said, may I die. And so Elijah, he was scared. She said, she's after my life. And he goes into the cliffs, and he's sitting there, and he's having a pity party. God says, what are you doing up here? He says, I've been just so zealous of you, Lord, and I'm here by myself. She, she seeks my life. And what did God tell him? You're not by yourself. Look, you have 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. You're not by yourself. And furthermore, you have things you've got to do. You still have work to do. He said, you need to anoint this one and this one and this one. This one is king. This one is prophet in your place. You've got a job to do. And you can't do it up here sulking. And so Elijah went. And we see him. He, or, he uh, anoints Elisha to take his place. He anointed, anointed uh, Jehu 
He would be king in Israel and so on and so forth. He had things to do. They were told, don't waste your time pitying yourself or feeling bad for yourself. Because when we're told, or when we're going through these times, we're told to remember, one, that we're children of God. God is our Father. And a father instructs his children. And we're told not to despise that instruction. It said, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord. And then we're told to be humble to that instruction. We see that in verse 9. It says, furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us. We gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? And so, if we're humble to our fathers, our parents here on earth as they instruct us, shall we not even be more humble to God? I used this example with the teenagers this morning. When a, when a student walks into a class, if they think they know more than the teacher, are they going to learn anything? No. If they think that they have no need to learn the material, are they going to learn anything? No. We humble ourselves and we listen to that instruction. And humility is a major characteristic of the Christian. And it is needed to be properly instructed by God. And so when we go through these times, whether it be persecution for our faith or going through the trials that happen just because we live on this earth, because sin has infected this world, what we are to do is to humble ourselves to God. And we look at some of the greatest Christians that's ever walked this earth and say especially the Apostle Paul was taught these lessons. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, I'm going to look at verses 7 through 9. But he says, And lest I, sh lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. He said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness." Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. And so looking at Paul, especially in this situation, he had just gotten through talking about this man that he knew, and most people think he's talking about himself, that got called up to the third heaven. He saw the glory of heaven. And, and we see that Jesus spoke to him personally on the road to Damascus. We see all throughout the book of Acts that God spoke to him personally. But he says, lest I should be exalted above measure, lest I should get too big for my britches, lest I should get too arrogant, lest I should get too prideful, he says, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh. And there's debate on what this thorn of the flesh may be. It could have been a person who harassed him. A lot of people think it was eye problems that he had. Because we see later on in some of his letters, he said, see with what big letters I wrote this to you that I signed my name, you know that I was here. Because he couldn't see well, so he couldn't write well. And so he had to dictate what he said to somebody like Silas or, or Timothy, and they would write it down. And sometimes he would sign his name at the end. And where he couldn't see, he would sign his name in big letters. But he still had this ailment. As, as godly of a man as Paul was... He had bad eyesight. And we talked about when we studied the book of Acts some of the ancient writings that described what Paul looked like. Well, he was uglier than ever, I ever thought about being. But I, I, we mentioned it before. We talked about it on Wednesday nights in our study. This, uh, I won't say recording, but this account of what he looked like. He said he had a unibrow and a big long nose and bow-legged and bald-headed. Maybe I'm starting to rival him. I don't know. But we look at Paul's life, and he had this thorn in the flesh. Never was there a more godly man than him, except Jesus said John the Baptist was. And what I, I look at this, he prayed for it to be removed three times. If we had an ailment like that in our life, how often are we praying to get it removed? 
Sometimes it's daily, right? Lord, get this thing off of me. Get, get this thorn out of my flesh. Heal me of this disease. Heal me of this ailment. But yet Paul said he asked three times. And after that third time, it, it seems to me he just said, you know what? God is teaching me something in this. And I will, I will go through this with him because he will be there with me. But he, Paul says himself, it was there to keep him humble. And the thing with Paul, he had this ailment that things like this caused people to stop serving God. Yet he still was traveling. Now he would have to travel with somebody. Couldn't see well, but he was traveling. He was spreading the gospel. He's checking in on the churches, encouraging them and strengthening them and writing letters. And a lot of us today, we get the problems that Paul has. Well, it's time for me to retire. It's time for me to give up serving God. But what Paul did was continue to serve God. And that's where he says, I will glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. He took glory that God was using him in the sicknesses and the things that he experienced. And not to mention, you know, we see in, in one of his letters how he talks about he'd been shipwrecked, he'd been beaten and flogged and persecuted by the Jews, all because he served God, but did it, keep him from serving God. No. He still did it. He still went through it. And what we see is he was humble as he went through it. God instructed him that whole way. He, he learned the whole way. That's where we look at in Philippians 3. He says, I follow after, not that I've already attained. He said, I'm not where I want to be, but I keep following after Jesus Christ. I will get there. And he did. And so when we think about, you know, we're suffering through these hard times, we have to remember, one, we're not the first to endure that. And that's one of the beauties of church. That's one of the beauties of this fellowship is when you're going through something, more than likely there's somebody here that has went through it as well, and they can help you. They can encourage you. They can strengthen you. But a lot of times when we go through this, what, one thing we may need to ask is, God, what are you teaching me through this? And I believe that God teaches us in everything. As he is the greatest of all fathers, he is always instructing us. In the good times, in the bad times, I think it's beneficial if we always look, Lord, what are you teaching me through this? Philippians 1.6 says, Being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. That means he is constantly teaching and instructing and working on you. And that's a good thing because when he gives up on me, that's when there's problems. We've always heard the phrases, whatever doesn't kill you makes you stronger, right? There's truth in that. We see that in the life of Paul. We see that in the life of martyrs in the, in the history of the church because some of them, they did die. But what they went through before that, you know what it did? It just emboldened their faith. It strengthened their faith. And then we have the, another phrase, when the going gets tough, the tough get going. When we see these trials in our life, those who have faith in Jesus Christ, what do we do? We keep going. Do we give up? Do we salt? Do we have a pity party? No, we serve Him. I think for those statements to be true in our lives, we have to be focused on the result. And that's what I've talked a lot about in, in Hebrews 11, in Hebrews 12, because it talks about in Hebrews 11, they look to the promise. They look to the result. And so we've got to see the result. We've got to see the lesson, the benefit, and the victory. So a lot of times we're going through this trial, and, and we don't understand what the, what the good will be in it. But God has promised us good. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 5 through 7. I'm going to read 4 through 7. It says, To an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith and the salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time, wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations, that the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus 
Christ. The trial of your faith. And again, that could be persecution for your faith. That just may be living in a fallen world. It said it's much more precious than gold. When you can look at that result, what you gain from going through that time. And then, of course, as Christians, Romans 8.28, and I think we, most of us may somewhat know it, but it says, We know that all things work together for good to them that love God to them who are called according to his purpose. And so if you love God, if you are born again, this trial that you're going through, it is for your good. And that's what we see in Hebrews 12, that it is for our profit. In verse 10, For they verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure, but he for our profit that we might be partakers of his holiness. And of course, in all of it, we glorify God. You know, we think about, as what was mentioned earlier, uh, Melinda's aunt. She's had both her legs amputated. She's had problems with a finger. But yet, through all of it, she's loved Jesus. She's praised Jesus. And those people that we see like that, that's a strength to us. That's an encouragement to us. In John chapter 9, verses 1 through 3, This is one of my favorite stories. And there's not a whole lot to it, I don't guess, but it's one of my favorite stories throughout the Gospels. It says, Jesus passed by. He saw a man which was blind from his birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither had this man sinned nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. This man was born blind. It wasn't because of something that his parents did wrong. It wasn't because of something he did wrong. The fact that he lived in a fallen world is what contributed to that being blind, but yet he was blind because Jesus said that the works of God should be manifest in him. And so in that situation, he was healed of his blindness. But when we look at any ailment that we go through, Any trial that we go through, we can look at it as being the purpose is that the works of God be manifest in us. Does that mean we'll be healed? No. But it means we can glorify God in that situation. That as what we said, when the going gets tough, the tough get going. You know, when the going gets tough, those with faith, they get through it. And it's like I say all the time, we often, when we go through troubles, we say, Lord, get me out of this, get me out of this. Which what we ought to be praying is, Lord, get me through this, because when we get through it, we're stronger on the other side. But then it says, Now no chastening, in verse 11, seemeth joyous at the present time. It doesn't seem fun. We may not seem to enjoy it. It seems grievous. But in the book of James... Verse, chapter 1, verses 2 through 4. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. Count it as joy, because if we look at the result, we see it in faith. And as it says in Hebrews 12, 11, it is the peaceable fruit of righteousness. And that harkens back to verse 10 where it says that we might be partakers of his holiness. All of these trials, all of these tribulations, everything that we go through here on this earth is for our holiness. Because in 1 Peter verses, or chapter 1, verses 15 and 16, it's quoting the Old Testament. It says, Be ye holy, for I am holy. All these trials are for our holiness our instruction in the Lord. And it's to draw us closer to Him. I heard a man this week, best I could tell, he wasn't a saved man, but he was talking about how much he had to suffer. And God was mentioned. He said, I just don't know why He's making me suffer so. Well, I had a theory. Maybe it's to bring you to Him. Because a lot of times, we don't acknowledge God until He's all we got. And that may be where some of our suffering comes from. But as his children, 
We look with the eyes of faith to the promise. The results of what we go through here on earth is to strengthen our holiness, to increase our holiness, for us to become more and more like Jesus Christ. And I'll close with this scripture. And I read it last Sunday night, but I'm going to read it again this morning. Titus chapter 2, verses 11 through 14. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God.